Okay, uh, before we get started, I want to remind all participants of a lovely disclaimer. You know, the purpose of this presentation is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be construed as a recommendation to purchase or sell any security. Microcap Club is not a registered investment advisor. Microcap Club, its partners, members, subscribers, affiliates may or may not hold positions in one or more securities mentioned on this program and may trade in any security at any time. Do your own due diligence and seek counsel from a registered investment advisor before trading in any security. Okay, I want to thank uh, the Microcap Club community for tuning into this business breakdowns and this conversation with Andrew Wilkinson. He's the co-founder of Tiny. And uh, my tag team partner today for this business breakdowns is Chip Maloney. You know, Chip is one of the best private investors I know out of Canada, and he operates you know, solely in the Microcap and Small Cap arena. You know, I've known him for a decade. He's been a member of Microcap Club since 2014. And uh, Chip, it's an honor to have, have you on the program today. Thanks for being here. Thanks a lot, Ian. Appreciate it. Looking uh, forward to this. The, yeah, the business we're breaking down today, again, is Tiny. And Tiny was profiled on Microcap Club back in 2021. Tiny is a, is a technology holding company with over 30 holdings across several technology buckets, and as well as an interest in an investment fund. Tiny is the result of really the vision of Andrew Wilkinson, who's with us. He's the co-founder and also his other co-founder, Chris Sparrow, who owns 10%. When you have two co-founders that own 80% plus of a public company, you're literally betting on them. So I've been looking forward to sitting down with Andrew and find out more about Tiny and where he's taking it. Andrew, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, so I think you're only 37. And you know, whenever somebody says that you're a youngster, it's because the person saying that's older than you. So I'm 42. But uh, I know you've, you've accomplished quite a bit. And I think the the journey with Tiny kind of traces its roots back to 2006 when you founded MetaLab. And I know it maybe occurred a couple of years prior to that when you were 18. Um, so you're really young then. And maybe a good place to start is I'm curious, you know, how did you get started down this path of kind of business building and investing? Yeah, I mean, um, it really started even earlier than when I started MetaLab. Um, all through high school, I was just obsessed with making money. My family uh, would fight about money. We never had enough money. And so for me, it was just something that I wanted to solve. I never wanted to be stressed out about paying the rent check. And so, uh, you know, I started out like any other kid working at McDonald's and uh, doing all the crappy jobs. And I stumbled into starting a online news website just for fun. I was really into Apple computers. And uh, I started posting articles and news, and before I knew it, I started getting a lot of traffic for that website, and we had uh, executives from Adobe and all these big companies calling us and saying, hey, can we advertise on the site? And so I started making a couple thousand dollars a month from ads, um, which when you're 15 years old is like being a billionaire. Uh, it was like the greatest thing ever, and I kind of skipped school. I barely attended high school. I ran my website. I had a great time doing that. Um, and then I ended up going to university. I got into a journalism program and uh, I gave away the website. I didn't understand that businesses had value. And so I just gave away the website that was making me all this money to um, the co-founders that I'd started it with and uh, walked away. And uh, I was living in Toronto, getting uh, you know tutored in how to uh, be a journalist at a large newspaper, which I came to realize very quickly was a terrible job um, because all the newspapers were shutting down. And so I lasted about three months. I dropped out and uh, I was living in my parents' basement. My parents are hard asses, so they were charging me $1,000 a month rent. And I had to go out and get a job. And um, I just got a job as a barista. And so I was making coffee every day. And, uh, you know, I actually enjoyed that job. I like making coffee. I've always been interested in it. I like talking to people. I'm a bit of an extrovert. And one day these two guys start coming into the cafe and they just sit on their laptops all day drinking espresso after espresso. And I'm like, you know, don't these guys have jobs? What's going on? And so I walk over and ask them what they do. And they say, we're web designers. And they tell me that they just go from small business to small business locally and they ask them if they need a website and they do that five or six times a month and they make like $20,000 a month. And so I thought that sounded pretty good. I started doing that myself. Um, and before I knew it, I had a, a web design agency. Uh, I called it MetaLab because I thought that sounded sophisticated. Um, and I started winning work from Fortune 500 companies and startups in Silicon Valley. 
Um, you know, and suddenly I had a gusher of cash uh, and didn't know what to do with it. And about, uh, man, probably 15 years ago, I started incubating businesses and starting a lot of different businesses. And then about six years into that, I realized that was very, very hard and exhausting. Even though I'd done very well with it, uh, you know, there's a lot of failure in starting companies. And so I started uh, investing and buying businesses. And I read about Warren Buffett. And, you know, I just realized that Buffett had abstracted business to the ultimate degree where he really just hires CEOs to run the businesses. And he has a tiny little head office that oversees everything. And so me and my business partner, Chris, we basically went out to try and create Berkshire Hathaway 2.0. Uh, we follow all the same kind of structural and reporting um, uh, you know, guidelines that they do. We don't synergize. We let all the CEOs manage their own businesses. Uh, we really just focus on capital allocation and incentives. Um, and we've now been doing that for almost 10 years. Uh, and we ha have about 35 majority owned companies. Well, that's, that's a incredible background. Well, why don't you get started in the presentation and tell us a little bit more about where Tiny is today? Sure. Let me just pour it over here. So, um, Legal disclaimer, everybody quickly, please uh, speed read that. Um, so I'll talk about the founding story, um, go into a little more detail than I did before. Um, so 2006, I start Metalab. Um, and really, you know, the interesting thing about services businesses is, especially digital services businesses, is that they really don't require capital. So I started the business with nothing. Um, when you win a project, you often get a deposit. So that's your working capital. And when we would win projects, we would frantically go out and hire people. And we didn't have any access to debt capital or um, venture capital or anything like that. And so we just had to run profitably. Um, we bootstrapped the entire business basically until we um, took WeCommerce public, which I'll speak about in a bit. Um, Chris, uh, my business partner, uh, joined as CFO in 2009. Um, when Chris joined, you know, I was, I'm a good natural capital allocator in that, you know, I didn't even understand accounting, but I just knew I wanted to see my bank balance growing. You know, it had to be bigger on day 30 than on day one. Uh, I just thought in cash flow. Um, but when Chris joined, he really actually understood accounting and built a lot of, um, you know, rigor into those processes within the business. And he really started encouraging me to, actually think through how I was deploying capital. So, um, you know, what I was doing is basically taking most of my profits from the agency and just randomly starting businesses. And Chris would actually say, hey, let's actually just do a napkin model. Let's just see if this is even worth doing um, and starting to track the path of a dollar. You know, how are we spending a dollar? And Chris is also an incredible negotiator and he's profoundly cheap. Um, you know, I like having a nice car. Chris, you know, uh, historically drove a 20 year old beater, uh, you know, wouldn't the other day I was in, um, Austin, Texas with Chris and I said, Hey, you, your shoes are falling apart. And he said, um, yeah, I got these for free at Ted three years ago. I was hoping they'd give out new ones this year, but they didn't. So like, that's how cheap this guy is. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, Chris came in and just started negotiating everything. I mean, we would, you know, buy new furniture for the office, need pit five vendors against one another. Uh, he would negotiate the coffee beans we bought in the office. Um, just we were, we were just incredibly cheap and focused on profit. And um, we started incubating all these startups. And that was really hard. Uh, you know, all sorts of silly stuff, lots of learning. I feel like the best way to learn what a good business is, is to read, read about it and learn from reading. But second best is actually doing and trying. And uh, we've tried almost you know, every business model imaginable, everything from a pizza restaurant to an online DJ school, to a skincare company, to a cat furniture business, uh, you name it, we've tried lots of stuff. Uh, and those were all miserable, hard businesses that I don't recommend. Um, in 2014 or so, uh, we had sold a business, we we're sitting on some cash, and we were still spitting out uh, quite a bit of cash flow out of the pre existing businesses. Um, and at that point, we realized that we needed to really start understanding investing, we couldn't just keep starting businesses and deploying our capital into that. Um, read about Buffett, we're very inspired. Um, and, you know, to be honest, I didn't really believe it. Um, you know, I, I, by that point had figured out how to run businesses as a CEO and kind of treat them as a machine, but it was almost too good to believe, to believe that I would be able to actually fire myself as CEO and have the business perform better. 
Uh, that's what we did as an experiment. We uh, removed ourselves as CFO and CEO of all the businesses. We hired new CEOs. And even we realized having a imperfect CEO, but a CEO who was incentivized correctly and dedicated to the business resulted in you know many doublings over one or two year periods. And so we were all in on this idea. Um, we started buying businesses. And when we um, when we did that, you know, we had had probably 50 private equity firms uh, reach out to us. We had actually gone down uh, into processes with many of them. And we'd experienced this horrible dance where for six to eight months, they'd kind of, you know, give you a term sheet that's great. And then you'd sign exclusivity and then they would grind you and they'd, you know, love your business before you sign the LOI. And then they'd shit all over it after you sign the LOI and they would adjust the terms and add earnouts. And it just was not as a founder, what I wanted as a founder, as an entrepreneur, I'm incredibly high paced. I was kind of going like, you know, this should take two to four weeks. This makes no sense. Um, which, you know, I think diligence, uh, like really deep diligence is extremely important when it comes to complex businesses, but most digital businesses are very simple. And so after being left at the altar or leaving at the altar with many private equity firms, um, we decided we would just do it like Buffett. You know, we didn't understand why more people weren't doing that. And so we started out um, finding founders who are like us, you know, kind of seven to 10 years in. Uh, running a profitable business, they either wanted to recap out, um, you know, a co-founder or uh, their investors or take a bunch of liquidity and stay on and run the business, or they just wanted to sail off into the sunset. Uh, we did, we've done both. Um, and uh, we had an incredible uh, first couple uh, acquisitions and we started making way more money than we ever could starting businesses. And we felt like, Instead of playing roulette, which is a very low odds game, we were playing poker where we actually had an advantage uh, and we felt we could outperform. So uh, it felt really, really good. Um, we formed that into a holding company called Tiny, um, which is, uh, you know, as I described, we run as like similar to Berkshire. Um, businesses all operate independently. They have their own management and finance teams. Um, and we grew so with $42 million of total invested capital, um, we grew to 700, just under $700 million in equity value before we merged uh, the business into WeCommerce. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, upon the completion of the merger of WeCommerce, uh, Chris and I won 81%. So now we own about 80% of the new public company. Now, a bit of history on how we got here. So Chris and I, um, you know, we really felt we were just going to own a private holding company. We're never going to have any shareholders. Um, but we'd always been very curious about public markets. I think as a capital allocator, there is no better place to be than a public company. The inefficient market, the ability to buy back your shares when they're undervalued, um, you know, issue them when you're getting a, you know, an exceptional valuation to be able to buy businesses with shares, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and tr to create better alignment with our team. Those were all very attractive things for us, but we were very, to be honest, we were quite scared of them. And so um, what we did to kind of dip a toe in the water was we spun out one of our businesses and we took it public uh, with Bill Ackman and Howard Marks, both of whom uh, we had met socially over in the years before and had indicated that if we ever did a deal, they would love to talk. And so we partnered with them and a small group of investors. Uh, we took that business public on the TSX Venture Exchange. Um, and basically what we were doing is buying uh, profitable Shopify theme and software businesses. Our thesis was very simple. Um, you know, e-commerce is going to double over the next 10 or 20 years. Shopify is the best platform. So this is kind of a rising tide and we can be a barnacle on the whale. We can um, own as much as possible of Shopify's ecosystem, their software uh, and app ecosystem. And so, um, you know, that's been an exceptional business. We've uh, bought a whole bunch there and basically we really enjoyed that experience. And so uh, last year we were looking at another spin out. And Chris and I just looked at each other and said, why are we doing all these spin outs? We're going to have three or four boards to sit on. Uh, we, you know, we won't be able to allocate amongst different buckets. You know, if the e-commerce business earns a dollar of profit, we can't necessarily move it over and allocate it to a different bucket. 
And so we decided to merge uh, Tiny, the kind of mothership, into the baby uh, and go public. And so uh, we went public, I believe, in February. Um, and uh, here we are. So I'll talk about, um, you know, the kind of the business um, and where it's at. Um, so we have about uh, over 30 investments. I think the, the current number is 35 or 36 majority owned businesses. Uh, we have a few uh, very, very small minority checks. Um, but for the most part, everything we do is control. Um, all of those earnings are consolidated into the, um, into the public company, except for a fund that we have. We have a $150 million um, USD fund that sits below. I'll talk about that in a bit. So um, this, these are the businesses that we have control over on the right. Um, so we have uh, Beam, our digital services platform. Uh, we actually have a CEO, uh, Pradeep Naluri, who runs that group. Um, and the way that we uh, create platforms is basically when we have enough of a same or similar business, we will group them into an operating platform and we'll put in a best in class capital allocator above them. And the idea is that over time, Chris and I will not be able to scale our attention across, you know, 100 businesses. And so it makes a lot of sense to have somebody who's an expert overseeing each of those groups. Um, we have our creative platform businesses. So, so these are um, social networks, digital good marketplaces. Um, we sell fonts on FontSpring. Um, and Zach Anisco oversees that platform. He's our longtime CEO of Dribbble. Uh, we have SaaS businesses. Um, most of these are overseen by Jordan at WeCommerce. Um, and uh, we own a variety of some of the top apps uh, Stamped is one of the top platforms for rating reviews on Shopify. Um, 460 is for uh, Insta Instagram integration. Um, Orbit uh, has a variety of different apps in the ecosystem, et cetera. And then we also own a bunch of Shopify theme businesses as well. Um, you know, these are very sticky businesses with very limited competition. Uh, we've seen that, um, you know, these businesses don't trade at huge multiples. Uh, they don't basically it's a it's a game of buying squares so when someone signs up for uh, shopify they're presented with a grid of themes and we try and own as many of those as possible uh, all the best ones uh, almost think of it as like a you know a royalty on shopify uh, checkout uh, when someone's setting up uh, and then we own a few businesses that are standalone those ones still report into chris ampere and i ampere is our president now on the left you'll see our fund so our fund is 150 million USD. Uh, we have 53 million left to deploy. Uh, we have a variety of investments in that, um, the largest being Aeropress. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Aeropress. It's a coffee maker company. Um, we, it's gonna sound a bit funny, right? So you, you look at these tech guys and go, why would they buy a coffee maker company? Um, you know, Chris and I, we've always been really interested in brick and mortar businesses because Investing in tech is like investing in sandcastles on a beach where the, um, the tide is coming in. They can be eroded very, very quickly. Um, these businesses can disappear overnight. And so we're quite limited in terms of the valuations we can pay unless the business is highly predictable. Um, Aeropress, on the other hand, I think that's a, a 50 year business. Um, you know, I think it's a little bit like owning uh, Bodum or French press if you could actually own a method of brewing. Um, so Aeropress, uh, is a really wonderful business because, uh, they basically spent nothing on, uh, marketing whatsoever. Uh, the inventor was the guy who invented the Aerobi Frisbee and, uh, he built this incredibly highly profit, incredibly profitable business where his coffee makers are basically sold in every gourmet coffee shop in the world. And, uh, he did, I think it was $50,000 a year of marketing. And this is a cult product. So people actually get tattoos of Aeropresses on their body. Baristas are obsessed with it. People expect it to be sold. Um, and if you talk to anyone who's an Aeropress owner, they tell you it's the best cup of coffee in the world. I just had a guy email me and say that he replaced his $10,000 espresso machine with an Aeropress for $49. Um, so really wonderful company. Uh, we showed Charlie Munger the thesis before we bought it, and he just said, buy this immediately. Uh, so we think it's a, a real winner. Uh, and then we own a variety of smaller businesses uh, beneath there, some SaaS. Um, I'll talk about some of those later. 
Um, these are the three types of businesses we buy. So um, I'll start with distressed and special situations. Um, so these are businesses that are distressed. I think of this almost like a um, like an oil tanker with $10 million of oil that's slowly sinking in the middle of the ocean. And the company just says, look, you can buy it for $500,000, extract as much oil as you can, right? So this is a sinking ship. It's going down, um, but it's going to take a while. And there's probably a lot of value in it. Now, this is not our favorite type of investment. We only do it when it's incredibly accretive for us. And it's not too much of a headache. Now, in the example of an oil tanker, that's dangerous, that's stressful, that's crazy, that's an engineering logistic nightmare. Um, we're buying digital businesses, often with recurring revenue. Um, so here, here's an example. Um, I'll talk about it on the next slide and then jump back. So we bought a business called Abstract. Um, Abstract, um, they were a company or are a company that um, basically was trying to do version control uh, or like GitHub, but for designers. So graphic designers would use a product called Sketch and they would design their, um, you know, design their mockups and then it would do version control on that. Now it's a great idea, but what ended up happening is a new platform came out called Figma, which you might've heard of, just sold to Adobe for $20 billion. Every, every designer in the world moved to Figma over the last five years. And so as soon as that happened, Abstract, which had raised like $30 million, could not raise any more money. And so um, they, and they were running at a really high cost base. They had a huge staff in San Francisco. They had fancy offices, et cetera. And so the founders couldn't raise more venture capital. And they did a deal with Adobe to do an aqua hire to sell their team to Adobe. Um, but the business was left with no one to run it. And so we went in. Uh, we paid very little for that business, and you know now it makes millions of dollars of annual profit. Um, and it was literally just right sizing. We didn't have to fire anyone because everybody uh, moved to Adobe, uh, which is critical for us. We don't want to come in and um, and slash people or anything like that. Um, and it, it, you know, we're just instead of treating it as a rocket ship, we're just kind of treating it as a melting ice cube, and we're you know taking the water as it melts. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the kind of, that's what a distressed special situation investment looks like. The next one is mismanaged gems. So these are good businesses, um, with maybe not the right operator or they're missing some kind of critical insight. So this could be as simple as, you know, pretty good recurring revenue business where, um, you know, the pricing just hasn't been increased. Um, so one example of that is um, we bought a business called We Work Remotely from Jason Fried and David Heinemeyer Hansen, the guys behind Basecamp. They had written a book about remote work about 10 years ago. They were very ahead of their time. And as part of that, they started a uh, job board and community called We Work Remotely. And it's a place for everyone to go and post their remote jobs. Um, people would pay $99 for a job posting. It's just a blue link. And then that's it. It's just a big page of blue links. Um, Jason is a friend of mine and he said, Hey, look, we don't want to run this business anymore. It makes 500 grand a year in, in revenue. It's too small for us. Um, do you guys want it? And so we buy it for, uh, 1.4 million. And, um, we, you know, we had a really simple thesis. We looked at this thing and we said, this has been ignored. There's been no work on SEO. There's been no marketing whatsoever. Uh, they haven't increased the pricing. All their competitors charge $299 and they charge $99. Uh, what would happen if we just increased the price to $299? And so we bought the business. We increased the price to $299. The volume didn't change. So immediately we've just you know tripled our um, earnings every year. And then we brought in a great CEO and we started optimizing SEO um, and doing marketing and sale, you know, more kind of enterprise sales and stuff. And that business, uh, you know, now does uh, many single digit millions of EBITDA. It's very, very profitable. So we literally pay ourselves back, you know, two to four X every single year on that investment. Um, so that's an example of a mismanaged gem. You know, it's not the best business in the world. It's a good business, but we can make it better. Um, now, the dream, my favorite type of business is a compounding business with a moat. Now, these don't come along very often. Um, one that we bought uh, about seven years ago is a company called Dribble. 
Dribble is the one of the largest social networks for designers. So graphic, web, uh, font, you name it. If someone's building digital, doing digital design, they would post on Dribble. And um, Dribble is one of the top, I think, three thousand websites on the internet. So it has a lot of traffic. Um, and every one of the things we loved about it was everyone went there directly. There's no middleman. So it's a true social network uh, with its own network effect. And why, why did designers go there? Well, designers go there because designers want to share their work with other designers. They want to get feedback. They also would get clients from it. So people would see their work and they would go, oh, I want to hire this person and reach out. Um, and they can also find jobs. There's a job board. Uh, they can also learn new skills. They, there's kind of an educational element, a variety of other revenue lines. We bought that business from two founders, Dan and Rich. Um, and strangely, when I was learning how to um, do web design, Dan Cederholm, the founder of Dribble, uh, his book was the first I ever picked up. So it was a really cool story. I was a huge fan of theirs. And I used Dribble to build Metalab. And so I knew the business very well. And I just watched it from a distance. And when I first kind of was sitting on a large pile of cash, I called up Dan and I said, if you would ever sell this, we would jump on it in a heartbeat. Dan said no. And I just started emailing him every single you know quarter, just over and over again for about three years. And one day I got a call from Dan and he said, hey, we're ready. Let's do this. Um, fly to Boston. So Chris and I flew to Boston and they just said, look, you know, we we really love doing design and programming, but we are not loving doing support and ad sales and all these other things. And we realized this business was massively under-optimized, that there was huge opportunities to do things that they just didn't want to do. And this is often one of the opportunities we see in founder-led businesses. Founders are very myopic. They like to focus on one thing, you know, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Sometimes it's marketing, finance, operations, product. These guys were obsessed with product. They didn't want to do anything else. And so, um, you know, for example, uh, we looked at their ad sales and we were like, oh my God, if they just sold this all at market prices with, with an ad sales team, they would do incredibly well. And so uh, we bought the business, we transitioned into C a CEO um, Zach and Isco, and you know, we basically 10 x the uh, revenue since we bought it. We've done a bunch of MA. It's been an incredible outcome for all of us. And, and that's a business where, you know, if someone had a billion dollars and wanted to compete with Dribble, it would still be hard. I think a network effect is one of the most challenging things to disrupt. As long as you keep the community happy, you don't mess with them too much. Um, you just have this huge. Uh, moat protecting you from competitors. So uh, we love those kinds of businesses. Um, so why do people sell to us? You know, this is always the question we get. You know, why wouldn't someone go and sell the private equity? Or why wouldn't they go raise a big venture valuation? Um, so, you know, if you go to venture, you're getting a big valuation, great for ego, but you're not really taking any money off the table. And you're really signing yourself up for a binary outcome. So when a venture capitalist invests, you're basically saying, I'm going to deliver a billion dollar return. Um, most founders are uh, you know, pretty scared of that. And they have built up, especially if they've built a profitable business, they don't like the idea of that just going away. Um, so you know, we'll see competitive competition there a little bit with secondaries and stuff like that. But for the most part, we don't compete with venture. Uh, with private equity, um, you know, someone can get a really nice um, you know, valuation from private equity, but often there's a catch. So, you know, the headline number is really big, but there's a massive pref or there's a ratchet or a clawback or an earnout or some structure that's added later. Um, I find private equity structures things so they, they win via financial engineering in almost every scenario. Um, and then also, they often don't want the founder to leave. Uh, I actually went through a six-month process with a private equity firm to sell one of our businesses. I was not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the business. Um, and at the very last moment, right as we we're about to go to the purchase and sale, they said, okay, Andrew, we'll do this if you stay on and you run the business. Um, so there's these kind of bait and switch things. It's just a very long miserable process. And also they're just known for changing the culture, messing up businesses. And they're at the end of the day, they're there to flip. They're going to take your baby and they're going to flip it 
and you might get a little more money for your baby. But to be honest, most founders do view their company as their baby and they don't really want to give it to a shitty foster parent. They want to give it to a nice foster parent. Um, so that's where we come in. Um, you know, we offer people full cash out or partial cash out. Usually our deals are very simple. Uh, it's usually just cash. Um, we don't, we try not to add a lot of terms. Occasionally we'll use preps or something if someone really wants a big headline valuation. Um, but at the end of the day, we really prefer simple structures. Um, you know, we do deals anywhere from a million dollars to $300 million is kind of where we think we could do, uh, our largest transaction to date was about 120 million. Um, we don't mind if the founders want to leave. It's great if they want to stay, if we think we're doing a great job. Um, but if they want to leave, we're also very comfortable with that. Or if they want to stay for a bit or, you know, advise or whatever it is. Um, and we just promise not to mess with the businesses. And, you know, we're incredibly proud of this. I look at all the businesses that we've bought. Um, you know, I can't think of one where we really went in and messed it up. I think um, for the most part, they're better than when we bought them. Um, so we really like that. Um, this is how we think about cap allocation within the business. Um, you know, our best dollar would be organic growth within the business. So for example, let's say we can buy ads um, that'll deliver $5 of value for $1 in one of the businesses. That's logical to reinvest in there. Um, we try and avoid boondoggly R&D projects though. So it's generally focused on things that actually drive growth or have provable ROI. Um, second has acquisitions. Um, and within acquisitions, um, you know, we have to use the fund for any non-bolt-in, non-strategic deal. Um, so we expect to deploy the fund probably by the end of the year. Uh, and then once we do that, every single deal will go directly into Tiny. Um, number three would be share repurchases. And number four would be dividends. Uh, we don't have any plans to dividend. I, I can't imagine we will, but never say never. Um, this is a leadership team. Um, so me, um, Chris, um, Ampere. Uh, so Chris and I really co-run the business. Um, the reason we're co-CEOs is because that's truly how we operate. Uh, we didn't want a situation where someone comes to one of us and says, oh, well, you're the president. I want to talk to the CEO. Um, because ultimately, we are actually equal decision makers. And what we do is we parcel out the business to some degree. So we each have different relationships with different CEOs or platform leaders. Um, Chris will kind of manage certain ones and I'll manage others. And then if there's any kind of disagreement or large decision, we'll come together and we'll duke it out and figure out what to do. Um, for the most part, we fully agree. But when we don't agree, we don't do it. Um, so if there's a deal that I'm hopped up about and Chris says no, we just don't do it. That's a no. Um, and that's what's made our relationship work is we're kind of both covering one another off um, and uh, and keeping each other in check. Um, Ampere, is, he runs day-to-day -day operations across all the businesses. So he's talking to all the CEOs, checking in on um, you know their numbers. Uh, are they hitting bonuses, looking at their incentives, um, dealing with day-to-day -day legal problems, uh, talking to capital markets, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then David is our CFO. Uh, he's been in the business for 30 years at a variety of different uh, TSX listed companies. Um, and he really is here to tell us how to operate in the public markets. It's been incredible having him because, um, you know, while we really know how to operate businesses and we understand how to uh, run tight financials as a private company, being public is a whole new ball game, raising capital is a new ball game. And so David's been invaluable as we've gone through that. Um, this is what the business looks like once we, and unfortunately I have to show it like this just because of the, um, the TSX rules, um, but this is the pro forma. Um, of where, where the two businesses uh, look like or what they look like when they're combined. Um, so about $200 million for revenue, um, $46 million of EBITDA. Um, and, uh, and then this is our capital structure. So Chris and I own 80% between the two of us. That's great, Andrew. Thanks a lot for that overview. That gives, I think, every, brings everybody who's not real familiar with Tiny and the WeCommerce story up to speed here. So maybe I'll just uh, jump into the Q and A here, if that's okay. Yeah, great. Um, you you had mentioned, uh, you know, the co CEO um, structure is kind of a unique structure in the public markets. Um, you mentioned a few of the strengths that Chris brings to to his role, including his frugality. <laughs> um, 
What are some of the other strengths that Chris brings to the role? And, and maybe you can just uh, comment on your strengths as well. Well, I would say that Chris is very, very strong on incentives. Um, and he's a very good negotiator. I think that I'm a good negotiator, but I'm impatient. You know, I will not hold the awkwardness. I will not, I won't spend the time to get it right. Chris will, um, here's a, here's an anecdote about Chris. Chris, uh, he wanted to buy a Jeep. And if it was me, I would have said, I'm going to go buy a Jeep. And I would have gone to the auto dealership. And, you know, maybe I would have walked out once, but I would have come back an hour later and I would have asked for a discount, but I probably wouldn't have got a huge discount. Chris spent eight months and he would text the sales guy the day before the quarter was over every time because he knew he wanted to hit his bonus. And finally the guy broke and he saved like seven grand, right? Chris is someone who's worth tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. He does not need to do this, but that is who he is. Um, so he's incredibly strong on that. I would say, you know, we have a very similar and complementary skill set. The biggest differentiation between us, though, is that I'm entrepreneurial and I'm a starter and I'm an optimist. And Chris is much more conservative. So Chris likes things that are guaranteed to pay out, whereas I get excited about ideas. Now, that serves us very well because, um, you know, I can still drive large growth opportunities or incubate businesses within or that sort of thing. Uh, or, or when I see a big opportunity, really push on it and fight with Chris to, to kind of figure out that we were going to, you know, we're going to invest in this thing. This makes sense. Um, here, here's an example is like, um, if it was up to Chris, uh, our, our fancy design agency, back when we did have an office, uh, it would be in a strip mall. Now that would be a great decision on the PL, right? Um, be really cheap. But no designers in their turtlenecks and Steve Jobs glasses, you know, are gonna come and roll up to the strip mall and feel good about that. And so there's moments where it's logical to spend more because it's good for the business, whereas Chris would sometimes get mired in just the cost of something. Um, so there's a lot of stuff like that where I will I will push uh and be right. And then there's other things where Chris will just completely bring me back down to size and make me realize that I'm just being impulsive uh, or overly excited about something. And then I'd also say um, we both are, you know, bullish or bearish. We seem to be at polar opposites. So if I'm bearish, Chris will be bullish and vice versa. So again, we're just constantly keeping each other in check. Um, and usually what also happens is that if we're working on a deal, usually only one of us is working on the deal. And so the other person will be the sober second opinion. So I'll be all invested. I've met the founder. I'm excited about them. And Chris will look at it and go, well, we're giving them too much up front. Or what about this risk? But I've invested the time, right? I've flown to meet the founder. I'm all in on this deal. And he'll be the check. Um, so I think it's mostly about that. It's about checks and balances with one another. That sounds like you guys have really complementary skill sets and balance each other really well. Maybe we can just dig into the, the three operating groups and platforms that you have, just starting with Beam. Can you just give it as, as an example of a, a product, maybe MetaLab you guys developed that can just give us a sense of the, the type of work that you guys do? Well, we're best known for doing Slack. Um, so Slack came to MetaLab in, man, what was it? 2014 or something like that. And they did the... Uh, the brand, the mobile app, the web app, all the original design for it, which ended up becoming a $27 billion company. Um, and that kind of put it on the map. Now, all the work that they do uh, is not that sexy. Um, you know, at the same time that they did that project, they also had a massive contract with Walmart to do all their e-commerce integration. Uh, that wasn't on the website, right? What Metal Lab is known for is kind of the sexy product startup stuff. But it also, uh, over time, has moved into doing more Fortune 500 work. Okay. And like, if a, if an 18 year old working as a barista has a laptop and an idea, they can get into this digital agency industry. Obviously, you need scale to get to this these sizes of contracts. But why would a customer choose MetaLab or one of the other Beam agencies over maybe one of the other your larger competitors? Yeah, so um, really, 
um, at the end of the day, there's really not that many people that have been doing this as long as we have and have kept our reputation. Usually what happens is that uh, an agency is really cool for five years and then they go sell to a big holding company. And then the holding company goes and kind of pillages it and messes it up and puts in a bunch of perverse incentives. All the best people leave and then they do very generic work, but they have really great sales to people. Um, Metal Lab has had the same ownership structure and much of the same team for, you know, I mean, 17 years since we started, but really kind of the core team has been there for seven to 10 years. Um, and so when you look at the track record of the sorts of products that they've been able to build, um, do you, you know, do you want to go and risk with some kid who's a barista when you're a fortune 500 and you are an executive, you're putting $20 million into a new digital product at Workday or some big, um, public company, they want to know that it's in good hands. It's like that saying, uh, you know, you don't get fired for hiring IBM. Um, and over the last 20 years, Metal Lab has just built a reputation for being the best product design firm in the world. And there's really not that many competitors that we um, compete with, right? There's Work & Co. Um, there's some of the big WPP and Omnicom agencies. But again, I think that they've really fallen behind because of the ownership structure and the incentives there. Um, and there's lots of smaller agencies that haven't been around that long. Um, but, you know, when there's a complex problem, when you know that not only do you need to design something, but you need to engineer it, you need to launch it, uh, you need it managed, you know, you want a turnkey solution. Um, I think Metal Lab is really the best bet for most Fortune 500 executives. And just to wrap up on Beam, so you guys have been going through a transition uh, in terms of the size of your customers from kind of more startup, kind of smaller companies to larger enterprise customers. And it seems like that's affected the operating margins just as you transition through that. How long do you expect that transition to, to take? Well, I think we're already, um, we're already seeing, what can I say? Um, yeah, I would say probably two or three quarters. I mean, it's impossible mm -hmm. to predict. At the end of the day, um, the biggest issue that they've had, as far as I understand, is just quoting these new, larger, complex projects is much more work. And they're, if you're imprecise in some way, it's almost like insurance underwriting. You now you're betting on, you know, finishing it within this timeline and this budget. And unlike some customers, the kind of more chill customers, when you're doing a deal with Goldman Sachs and you say it'll be $3 million, it's going to be $3 million unless you get an approval. And so there's been a few situations where the team wasn't used to working at that scale and they got in a little above, above their head. But I think they've worked a lot of that out now. Um, so I expect that in the next couple of quarters, they'll dial that in. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Andrew. We've got a number of questions in the queue here. So I'm going to kind of skip through the e commerce and dribble businesses. I think you gave a really good overview of those. And, you know, dribble, I mean, the, it just seems like a kind of an un, un, uh, appreciated gem of a business with just some really, really excellent uh, network uh, effect economics there. So maybe we'll just move on to. Um, uh, I think you've said that between you and Chris, your your biggest jobs are capital allocation and then also incentivizing management and funding management for, for these portfolio companies. I'm just wondering if you could just talk about the acquisition environment right now. I think you guys have said that it's pretty pretty rich environment uh, if you have capital to invest. So I'm just wondering if you could just, um, how attractive is uh, the acquisition environment right now? Well, it's finally exciting. Um, so we raised, as I said, a $150 million fund in 2021, and we sat on it for over a year and did almost nothing. And then we were able to do that AeroPress deal. Um, but we really, I think we've, we've been at it for three years or something like that. We still haven't deployed the whole thing because there just hasn't been that much to do. Um, we found that with all these crazy headline numbers and cryptocurrencies and you know venture valuations flying around, we were having people come to us and say, um, you know, hey, I'll sell you my business for a hundred million dollars. It does one million dollars of revenue, and I lose five a year. Uh, like just lunacy. Nothing was trading on earnings, and everyone thought things only go up. And now we're starting to see fear creep back in. We're starting to see opportunity. Um, people have a sense that hey, the doors are closing, the party is over. 
Uh, maybe I did want liquidity. Maybe I do want to buy that new house. Maybe I do want to have a stock portfolio. Um, and so we're seeing a ton of inbound interesting opportunities. And then also, given uh, our skill set, we're also very well positioned for distressed venture. And as I pointed out with the abstract business, there's these wonderful businesses that are doing tens of millions of dollars of revenue, and they just have the wrong cost structure. And so if we can buy these businesses for cheap and uh, structure them appropriately, these businesses can be incredible. That's great. That's great, Andrew. Thanks for that. Um, I'm just wondering, you, you mentioned you guys do kind of napkin math to sort of uh, plot out the economics of, of these businesses. When you're looking at a, an acquisition, do you kind of back the envelope uh, figure out, do you have any return hurdle rates or payback period? Do you use payback periods at all? So you're going to laugh, but I have a really simple um, way of doing this. I just say, how do I pay myself back in five years? And so if I'm paying 5X, well, great. It'll take five years to pay back if nothing goes too wrong. Um, maybe a little faster if things do well. Uh, if I'm paying 10X, I got to double the business. Can I double the business? How realistic is that? Can I triple the business? You know, what, what does that look like? How do I get 20%? And if I'm going to pay up, really pay up, you know, pay 20X or something, it better be growing like crazy. Uh, I better be able to grow that business a hell of a lot. And, you know, once in a while, we'll pay a big multiple uh, when there's a really incredible moat. Um, but most of the time, I'm just working to that five-year horizon. And I don't think about that in terms of selling the business again. Um, you know, this is not exit value. This is literally, how do I get a 20% cash yield on this business? If I buy it for hundred dollars, I want to make $20 a year in dividends. In terms of financing these acquisitions, like right now, I think your leverage is a little under two times EBITDA, adjusted EBITDA, um, got obviously some cash in the balance sheet, but some debt that I think you mentioned the AGM that's kind of ring fenced, uh, in the portfolio companies. How do you plan to finance acquisitions kind of in the next few years? Yeah, so we don't have any um, any debt, any significant debt other than like credit lines and stuff uh, in the head office. And then in the subsidiaries, we have some debt in Beam and we have some debt in WeCommerce, um, as you mentioned. Uh, in terms of financing uh, deals, I mean, we have quite a bit of liquidity. Uh, like I mentioned, we have 53 million USD. So what is that? Uh, 53 USD. Okay. So we have 70 million Canadian um, in the fund still remaining. And then I think we have about $30 million of cash uh, across the businesses. So we're feeling comfortable to do smaller acquisitions ourselves. Uh, and I think we'll tap equity markets uh, if we see something that's really big and we're excited about. Appreciate that, Andrew. Do you have a hard stop time here? Because we've got quite a few questions. No, I can go over. Here. You good? Okay. Can I ask you just maybe one more and then I'll turn it over to Ian here? Um, one of your other jobs kind of as co-CEOs is to find and incentivize management. How do you incentivize management to think like owners? Well, at the end of the day, if you're an owner, you care about debt earnings typically because uh, those end up coming to you as dividends. And so that's what we generally do. We focus people on net earnings. Uh, if they really want to own stock, then we'll actually allow them to buy in. Um, so we'll say, okay, you want stock? Um, you know, We're going to give you an annual bonus, but we want you to take your entire annual bonus and plug it into buying stock. Now, that might be at the tiny level for a head office employee, or it might be uh, in a subsidiary. Uh, we might give them equity, but make them buy it. Uh, we have done stock options in the past. We just find it's too much of a lottery ticket. It doesn't create true alignment because if the earnings fall below the strike, then they're, you know, it's a zero. They don't care anymore. I want someone to, if they invest a hundred dollars and it goes down to 70, then they still have something to lose. Uh, I don't want them to feel that all is lost and it doesn't matter. That's great. Thanks, Andrew. Maybe I'll turn it over to Ian here and maybe he can just work his way through some of the questions in the queue here. Sure. Yeah, we have quite a few questions. Maybe the uh, first question is, you know, Warren Buffett says book value is the best way to value Berkshire and book value growth to evaluate their success. How do you think about Tiny's valuation, you know, especially deciding between issuing stock, buying back stock? You know, is book value an accurate measure? Like how should investors kind of value Tiny? Hmm. You know, to be honest, it's not something I think about because I'm 
usually a private market investor. And I'm just learning this public market thing in terms of, um, you know, how to value the business. I think um, at the end of the day, it's kind of similar, right? For me, let's say I was looking at tiny stock. Uh, I believe we're trading right now at 14 or 15 times EBITDA or something like that. I would be asking, how do I pay myself back in five years via earnings yield? Um, so I'd be looking at that EBITDA number and saying, okay, is that going to grow to 150 million over the next five years? Is that going to be 100 million in five years? And I'd be working backwards from there based on what they're comfortable with in terms of their return. Uh, you know, I'm obviously very bullish. I think the stock is undervalued based on what I know Chris and I can do. Um, and we're obviously very incentivized. We have basically our entire net worth uh, in the in the business. But, um, but yeah, I, I don't really know how uh, how to value it. There's so many different ways to do that. Um, does Tiny have regular post-mortem process to determine how effective acquisitions and initiatives were in hindsight? Yeah, we write investment memos. Um, or we've started to over the last year or two. Um, generally, you know, we know if something is working very quickly because the thesis usually plays out within uh, two or three months of buying the business. Um, we like to think about it as a bird in the hand versus two in the bush. So when we buy a business, we want all of the wins that make the investment to be uh, very short term, very simple. And then it doesn't mean there can't be two in the bush. There can't be opportunity. Um, so an example would be buying Dribble. We knew that if we added proper ad sales, we felt we could do two hundred thousand dollars a month of ad sales versus uh, thirty. They were doing thirty when we bought it. Within three months, we got it to two hundred thousand dollars a month. Uh, at that point, I knew the investment was going to pay out. I, I just knew, okay, we've won. And then all the opportunity that was unlocked since then, that was just gravy on top. But my thesis played out within three months. Maybe a, a, another question here. You know, I know one of the the ways you really matured as an investor was, I think, when you started, you were operating these businesses yourself, and you realized, no, let's let's find great CEOs to run them for us. And so, I guess the question would be, like, what are the kind of the, the key things you look for when you're hiring great leaders to run your subsidiaries? Hmm. Well, okay. Um, I would say the number one thing we look for is experience running a same or similar business, but double the size. So if I, let's say, um, let's say I'm buying an agency and uh, you know the agency is doing $20 million of EBITDA, I don't wanna hire a CEO who's been running a $5 million EBITDA agency. I wanna hire someone who's been running a $40 million EBITDA agency who grew it from 20 million. And I wanna put that person in and say, okay, now go do that all over again. You already know all the speed bumps, you know, all the things to do. Um, I also want to hire someone I agree with. Um, you know, I want to go into the meeting and I want to leave uh, feeling that I'm energized, that I'm nodding along, and that they're doing all the things that I would do, or they're suggesting things I hadn't even thought of that are excellent. Um, I do not want to feel drained. That's probably the number one red flag when we've made bad hires, is there's been people where the resume is correct, what they say is correct even, but you leave the meeting just feeling like, oh, like I just don't feel good. Um, and that can be, you know, they're a bad actor or they're just not a culture fit. Um, and then third, and most importantly, uh, I want someone that I would trust to babysit my kids. Uh, you know, I can't give someone a business if I don't feel that they're a trustworthy, good person. Uh, and anytime I've compromised on that, that's always been a terrible outcome. I mean, we had a, in one of our businesses, we had a CEO who defrauded us. And from day one, you know, there's always this feeling of, man, this guy's good, but just don't trust him. There's something. I wouldn't leave him with my kids. Um, always a red flag. Yeah, and sort of bumping up against an hour, maybe a good a good question to end on. You know, you're-, you're I'm okay. If you, guys, if you guys want to go over, okay. I'm fine. Totally up to you. Okay. Well, you're surrounded by some amazing folks, you know, on the investment side. You know, when you talk about Charlie Munger, Howard Marks, Bill Ackman, I'm curious, like, what are some of the- what are some things that you learned from them being so close to them, you know, growing tiny and investing in it? One of the, one of the craziest things, I had this conversation with um, Charlie Munger and he said, in all my life, I've never changed anyone. Like I've never actually changed anyone's mind. And I thought that was such a crazy thing to say. And I, I thought about it because we've had this experience where 
okay, let's say um, one of our CEOs comes to us and says, hey guys, um, the key thing is that we do paid marketing. And Chris and I go, oh, you know, for a business like this, no, 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 we've, we've done that before. It never works. You know, here's what's going to happen. You're going to hire the PPC agency. It's going to take 30, 30 grand to get started. The numbers are going to look like this. I can tell them all this, right? They'll sit there and nod, nod along. And then at the end of the, you know, me blathering on, they'll go, okay, but I don't think you get it or whatever it is. So they're stuck on this idea. Now, if I block that idea, if I just say, you're not doing that, that CEO will now feel resentful to me. They'll feel they're not operating their own business. They can't make their own decisions. And when they don't hit their bonus that year, they're going to say, well, I would have hit my bonus if Andrew had let me spend the money on PPC. You know, he took away my opportunity. And so what Chris and I have settled on is really understanding that we're okay with our CEOs making non-fatal errors. It's okay for them to lose a small amount of money trying something, just not a fatal amount of money and, and certainly not to imperil you know, the business itself or their employees. And so um, that moment with Charlie Munger is just so confirmatory, realizing like, okay, here's this guy who's 98 years old and he feels this way and he's run a similar business. Uh, that was just incredible. Uh, with Bill, just the, there's something that, you know, he's, he's worth like, you know, $8 billion or something like that. And I think he maybe has 40 or $50 million invested in tiny. And, you know, you think about it, that's kind of insignificant for him. And he picks up his phone. If I ever call him, he calls me back in like two minutes. He checks in, he just wants to be helpful. And there's something so wonderful about having a partner like that. And it's been really inspiring for me where I go, how do I do that for you know people I invest in? How do I ensure that I make them feel seen and that I'm I've got their back? Um, and you know, Bill has really, like I said, stepped up in so many ways where he didn't need to. He's helped us with things that I mean, he went and you know he he's negotiated with investment bankers on our behalf and helped us um, you know helped us do um, you know debt debt restructuring and all, all sorts of stuff. And um, he's just yeah, he's awesome. So uh, lots of learnings. Oh, that's uh, that's that's one of the big. Well, you can call it intangible, but it's a tangible asset you have there. Just the folks you have around you. Um, I think we're going to leave it there. I think that's a good place to end it. Uh, we appreciate the the time you spent with us, Chip. Thanks for leading it as well. Um, hey, thank great. You guys. Thanks yeah, a lot, thanks Andrew. We appreciate your time.